Sharp Objects is a southern gothic show reminiscent of True Detective in its murderous atmosphere and of Big Little Lies in its focus on womanhood and music. It is based on a Gillian Flint's novel, which you may know from another novel which was uh, made into a movie, Gone Girl. One of Flint's creative partners in Sharp Objects is Martin Oxon, which you may know as an executive producer and then showrunner for the sixth season of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. It stars Amy Adams as an alcoholic journalist that is forced to go back to her hometown to write about the mysterious killing of two young girls. Basically, there was no chance in hell that I wouldn't miss watching Sharp Objects, and if you haven't, I highly recommend it. I also recommend that you stop this video because there will be spoilers. Sharp Objects utilizes in part non-linear storytelling, not so much to reveal relevant parts of the plot like Westworld or Lost Do, for example, but more as a way to let the viewers understand the many layers of its main character and the many shadows surrounding her. In a more direct way, although it's very quick paced, it does so by also highlighting certain words, visuals and songs throughout each episode that make up a sort of contour of what lies beneath the surface of what we are watching. Mainly these messages Messages relate to the main character's self-loathing because if anything Sharp Objects is an extension of Camille's own self but they can also be warning signs, dark jokes about femininity and social expectations as well as ironic commentaries on characters and their actions. In this video I want to focus on these visual, written and auditory clues and their meaning which you probably missed throughout the first five episodes of the show. In the premiere episode Vanish, the first word we see is ask with an exclamation point on Camille's cubicle in the office. While at the beginning this could be seen as a simple reminder of Camille's job, that of being a journalist, in the wider context there can also be a way to highlight the importance of asking the right questions in regards to the mysteries surrounding the murders in Wing Up and the past life of Camille. On a more personal level, it could also be a cry for help, given the fact that the word is spelled out with literal sharp pins, or what Camille has been lacking in her childhood and is seeking for now, someone who asks the real questions about and to her. Let me guess, Jackie O'Neill? She's a character. She's sweet. Only woman who is genuinely nice to me. Oh, come on, don't give me that bullshit. I heard about you, Princess of Wingap, bow down. I said genuinely. Because Camille has been extremely misunderstood, specifically by her mother, but also by the whole town of Wing Up. The way she's seen by the town folks is reiterated in the word appearing on a car. Before leaving for Wing Up, it was dirt, the way in which Camille sees herself. Once arrived in Wing Up, it changed to dirty, the way in which the town sees her. Thought you were the wild one. I hung out in parking lots and I talked to boys. Wild was different back then. The way Camille feels by going back to Wing Up is highlighted in several ways throughout the premiere episode. While she's driving, her highway sign changes to last exit to change your mind. Likewise, when she first arrives in Wing Up, a visual sign, a poster in the police station that reads don't be a victim is a way to reinforce her need to get over a past trauma, something also stated by her boss slash friend in a previous scene. Life is pressure. Grow up. These clues blur the line between reality and hallucinations, although we can always tell which ones are a visual representation of Camille's perspective. For example, the words scratched on her home desk that reads bad and a drunk, or the way the stereo system in her car quickly flashes the message wrong after she spent the night drinking in the bar, are all hallucinations of Camille's self-loathing. In the final shots of the episode, the show reveals Camille's skin, which is completely covered in words that she etched on herself. In the Gillian Flynn novel, Camille explains, I am a cutter, you see. I am a very special case. I have a purpose. My skin, you see, is creams. It's covered with words. Cook, cupcake, kitty, curse. As if a knife-welding first grader learned to write on my flesh. 
In the fifth episode, Camille's skin is shown even more while she's at the store with her mother and half sister. We can see close-ups of her words, one of which trumps over all others, wrong, which we have already seen on the first episode. The reason why this word is particularly telling has also to do with its placement. Of all the labels that Camille attaches to herself, wrong is placed on a sternum, a place to use to specify who you are and what's your name. The show clearly emphasizes sharp objects throughout each episode to show us how present is the need for self-harm in Camille. Going back to the first episode, Ama shows Camille her dollhouse and for a brief moment we can see the word girl scratched onto it. The dollhouse is a perfect symbolism for the femininity that is expected out of the women in Wingap and that Ama needs to adhere to. In Wingap, every woman gets a nasty label if they don't conform to the rules of engagement. What's your label? <laughs> Go. Too many. Her doll-like clothes and the way in which Adora treats her as if she may break any second are suffocating Emma. I'm incorrigible too. Only she doesn't know it. She uses the doll house both as a way to exert control over a perfect replica of the house in which she has no control over and as an excuse to fulfill her role in the eyes of a mother. Amma's duality is clear. While Camille covers herself in shame, Amma gets any opportunity she can to show less clothes as she possibly can. Camille. What? Don't tell Mama. She is childish but disingenuous and quite aggressive when she's free to be herself. That's enough. Okay. Oh, you gonna hit me? Yeah, you want me to? <laughs> huh? Be dangerous. Be dangerous like mama said. <laughs> That's visually implied in the beginning of the fifth episode during the dream sequence that Camille has about Ama. Several words appear on the front of the train, words like sudden and trash, bitch and cry and nag. Ama's duality is exemplary of the duality of any girl and woman in Wingap. When Camille looks around Natalie's house, the second victim, she sees a girl's pink t-shirt with the word whatever printed on it. This show sends us the message that Natalie was just another girl stuck in the social expectations of the town, restricted to her color paillette of pink and purple, but that probably didn't conform to the feminine norms of Wing Gap. That was Natalie's favorite color. Oh. Well, actually her folks said it was black, but that just seemed too grim. So her second favorite. In this town, everything revolves around the role that you're supposed to play. If you don't, there's something wrong with you, clearly. For example, Natalie's brother is considered suspicious by almost all of the town residents simply because he cries a lot for the death of his sister, and men aren't supposed to cry. The show clearly states the antiquated views of the town by opening with the 1950 song Dance and Angela by Franz Waxman to suggest that we and Camille are about to enter not just a different world, but a different era. Detective Richard Willis is another character that has to, in his way, conform to Wingap's society rules. As a non-local, someone from a big town is treated as a foreigner whose crazy ideas about the murders, or rather the possibility that they may be executed by a Wingap resident, remind us about its difference. In the third episode, we can see a word from Richard's point of view. The word is fate and is printed on a candle. The scene tells us two things. One, that Richard has indeed fate in solving these mysteries, and two, that his outlook is far more stable than Camille's. This is evident in the lettering differences between the composed fate of Richard and the scratch words from Camille's perspective. At the beginning, Camille is wary of Richard. The way that she approaches him can be easily described by another word, changing from billiards to belittle when Camille looks towards Richard sitting in the corner of the bar. However, by the end of the fifth episode, Camille grows closer to Richard, also pushed by the incredibly dry speech that Adora gives her. And during their sex scene, the show does state that by illuminating the word closer on Camille's body. In episode three, we start seeing Camille's flashbacks and memories about her time in a rehab facility. While she's at the intake desk, a rehab sign quickly changes from from you're not invisible to you are unworthy, which once again show us how Camille sees herself. So you got your old money in your trash. Mm -hmm. Which one are you? Trash. 
from old money. However, these memories are more important in that they introduce us to another person that Camille has lost, a roommate Alice. Camille shows her specific words on her body, fuck you as a retort and fuck you up as a way to showcase that they are the same, they're both fucked up. The show plays with the three young girls of Camille's past and present, her dead friend Alice, her dead sister Marianne and her current stepsister Amma. The three young figures appear and disappear continuously in a fog, sometimes without being able to discern which is which, applying to each elements of other young girls, like when Alice briefly appears to her without feet, a feature of the murdered young girls in Wing Up or when either of them appears to Camille as the Lady in White, a legendary figure which represents the loss of a daughter and the sense of purity before death. The show wants to make us understand how Camille sees these girls as innocents that she couldn't save. In this sense, she's very protective of them, like a mother would. Interestingly, while following Amma in episode 3, Camille is hearing through her headphones the song Mama's Gonna Give You Love by Emily Wells. As if the title isn't self-explanatory, the lyrics of the song say, Letters on my body, I can read your name. Music on sharp objects is almost always diegetic. We hear the same things that the characters do. And not only that, but are the characters themselves that set the scene. They choose the music in every immediate moment, providing a definition for their personality and the context in which they operate in. For example, music is, for Camille, a way to self-medicate. She listens to music all the time while driving, in bed, in the bath. She chooses dark rock and sometimes hysterical sounds that let her focus on anything else besides drinking or self-harming. On the contrary, the music chosen by her stepdad and mother that sets the mood in the house are classical ominous tracks. The juxtaposition of calm music and hostility in the house is perfectly embodied by Adora, an apparently weak woman who has everyone under her control. Sharp Objects makes evident use of contrasting juxtapositions not just in its characters but also in the way it showcases the corruption of its environment as a whole. A little boy shows Camille his gun to prove that he's safe. A cabin, which is treated as a protecting space for Hama, is shown to be decorated with pornographic pictures. The town seniorage proudly presents an housewife serving delicious, nourishing meat as a way to welcome Camille, a woman who literally carves her own skin. If you enjoyed this video, as usual, uh, you can subscribe to my channel and hit in the notification bell button. And you can also follow me on Twitter. I'll leave the link in the description down below. Um, as usual, I always welcome feedback, positive and negative. So I'll see you next time.